London, Europe's biggest and busiest metropolis, visited by 28 million tourists every year. They come for history, culture, and entertainment. But behind the glamour of the bright lights lies a concealed, sinister city that most travelers don't get to see. This is the hidden city of London. London is a city rich in history, but you won't see it all from a double-decker bus. There are tunnels that stretch for miles and miles. They're all still top secret. I don't have access to them any more than you do. In this program, we explore a secret subterranean world. London's the most haunted capital in the world, but the Tower of London is the most haunted building in the world. We hunt for ghosts of centuries past and unravel the most famous English mystery of all, Jack the Ripper. In 1888, Jack the Ripper was the most feared name in London. The Ripper preyed upon prostitutes of the East End. In just 10 weeks, he savagely murdered five women. But to this day, his true identity remains a mystery. In Victorian England, the east end of London was a gloomy network of narrow, cobbled streets, shrouded in thick smog. Life here was hard. We're talking about real poverty before um, social money paid to people or anything like that. And if you didn't have the money and you didn't steal it, you died, you couldn't feed yourself. For women, it was even, even harder. And so many of them, in desperation, would turn to prostitution. Women prostituted themselves in this area for three pennies, two pennies, or a loaf of stale bread. So what you have in this area is a lot of drunkenness. You have a lot of domestic violence. But murder itself was uncommon. In the fall of 1888, one man would send the murder rate off the scale. The Ripper is the world's most notorious serial killer. His gruesome crimes have spawned hundreds of movies and books. But his true identity has remained a mystery for over 110 years, and his story continues to vex the public's appetite for the truth. So who was he? Why wasn't he caught? And how did he escape detection? We investigate the case and follow author and Ripper guide Donald Rumbelow around London's East End to the actual murder scenes. Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to London Walk's Jack the Ripper Walk. My name is Donald, I'm your guide for this evening's walk. Everyone you meet on a Jack the Ripper tour has got a suspect, a theory. Each of them believes that they have the solution. They'll always tell me that he is a doctor, a member of the royal family. Even their uncle Sidney, way back, was believed to have been Jack the Ripper. The tour begins on the boundary between two of the oldest parts of London, the city and the East End. The city of London still has its own separate identity from the rest of London. It has its own Lord Mayor, its own form of government, and, as far as this story is concerned, its own police force. The contrast between the city of London and the East End is as obvious today as it was in 1888. The East End is a cosmopolitan mix of Cockney markets and Asian communities. Today, as then, it is patrolled by the Metropolitan Police. The city, on the other hand, is the center of finance and banking, its buildings symbolic of money and power. These streets are patrolled by the City of London Police, a century ago, rivalry between these two forces was intense. Now, straight away, you see the problems you're going to get. 
when you have a serial killer like Jack the Ripper, who decides to ignore this artificial division between the two police forces and starts zigzagging backwards and forwards across the boundary. All of the Ripper's victims were prostitutes. These women knew the risks they faced, especially at the height of hysteria over the murders. But their choice was to continue walking the streets or starve. Jack the Ripper would choose his victims at random and kill them before horrifically mutilating their bodies. The autopsy reports have been examined by forensic pathologist Dr. Ian Hill. This would suggest that her jaw had been lifted up so the knife could be drawn across her throat. She was trying to claw the murderer's hand away from her throat with a jagged cut. Her abdomen was laid widely open. Her throat was cut, sufficient to kill her. It was severely mutilated. The tip of the nose was almost severed, damaging the spinal column. All of the organs were taken out. The heart had been removed and was not found. At some stage, she put up a fight. The extreme violence of these crimes set them apart from other murders of the time. Historian John Ross is a retired policeman and an expert on the Ripper killings. When you start getting people cut up and parts of the bodies taken out, that is unusual. It was a series of murders that did create a lot of ripples, uh, very, very high up in society. Matthews, the Home Secretary, was, you know, castigated over it. Sir Charles Warren lost his job as commissioner as a result of it. Queen Victoria. Uh, was asking questions of her, of her parliament about this, and there will be a lot of pressure on the police to do something about it. The murders were committed within an area of less than one square mile. So why did police fail to secure a conviction? The forensic science was very, very limited in what they were able to do. Fingerprinting in 1888 um, hadn't been invented. So the policing in those days would be presence policing. You would have policemen out in the streets, walking up and down, being seen by the public in the hope of, to stop crime being committed. Back in 1888, you couldn't tell the difference between animal and human blood. So a murderer, lots of slaughterhouses in this area, he could walk through the streets in a smock covered with his victim's blood. He could have left his fingerprints at the murder scene and there's no way you could have actually linked him to the murder. The only way the police could arrest the killer was to hope to catch him in the act. It was a massive logistical operation. Extra bobbies were drafted in from every police station in London. But would this be enough to stop Jack the Ripper? In 1888, the city of London was in panic. Two women had been brutally murdered, and Jack the Ripper was still terrorizing the streets. It wasn't until one month after the first murder that police had a breakthrough. Jack the Ripper got careless. On September 30th, in a frenzy of attacks, he struck twice in one night. I want to talk about the first murder on the night of the double event. Now, the body was found at one o'clock in the morning by a salesman, and as he turned his pony into the yard where he lived, so the pony shied away, it jumped away from this bundle lying in the gateway. The first victim of that night, a Swedish prostitute named Elizabeth Stride. And when the salesman went to get a light, the murderer slipped out from behind the gateway, headed west towards the city, crossed that invisible boundary between the two police forces, picked up Catherine Eddowes, and came with her here to Mitre Square. Now, there are two things you need to know about Mitre Square in 1888. First of all, it was patrolled every 15 minutes by a City of London policeman. The other thing about Mitre Square is that it had an echo on it. So that for eight of those 15 minutes, 
as the policeman patrolled the surrounding streets, he was always within earshot of the square. So when he shout, and he scream, and he cry for help in those eight minutes, he could pick up in the surrounding streets. But then so too could the policeman and his family there. So too could the night porter there. So too could the witnesses out there who saw Edo's at 1.35 a.m. talking to her killer with her hand on his chest. 15 minutes later, Catherine Edo's was found dead in Mitre Square by a patrolling police constable. She'd been ripped open, the insides lifted out and dropped over her right shoulder. And nobody had seen or heard a thing. Why no one heard her being slaughtered remains a mystery. It was his second killing in 40 minutes. What he did next defies logic. He calmly returned to the East End, the one direction that would lead him straight into the massive police manhunt that was already going on. Within minutes, his trail had been picked up. Blood was discovered dripping from a street fountain. He has then followed to an apartment block, which is where we're heading in the direction of now. The street running left to right behind me is called Goulston Street. And the apartment block immediately behind me was here in 1888. If you follow those three lights down the wall, they terminate in a little, little doorway now covered by a roller shutter. But it was in that doorway, then an open doorway, that the message was written in chalk on the wall and the piece of apron on which the knife had been wiped was dropped on the floor below it. Now the message that was written inside that doorway said, <coughs> The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Everybody argues over it. You've got this double or triple negative, and what does it mean? At 5 a.m., Sir Charles Warren, Chief Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, crossed into city police territory to see the message for himself. Ignoring the protests of the detectives guarding it, Warren did a baffling thing. He wiped the evidence from the wall. But why? Experts believe his motives were not as corrupt as they first appeared. Immigrant communities have always doubled as convenient targets for fingers of suspicion. And a century ago, these streets were home to Polish Jews. There was a tremendous amount of anti-Semitic feeling in this country at this time. I think it's very, 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 very possible that Sir Charles Warren on seeing this was very concerned about the, perhaps, anti-Semitic rioting that would take place afterwards. I really believe he was a man who was trying to police London properly and uh, was just getting rid of something which might incite racial intolerance. As the media worked the public into a frenzy, hoax letters flooded the mailboxes of those connected with the case. One letter gave the murderer a name he would never lose. The name Jack the Ripper uh, doesn't appear until after the fourth killing. A letter is received at the Central News Agency, begins Dear Boss, and signed Jack the Ripper. Every uh, graphologist has come down with the same thing, that that letter wasn't probably written by um, some psychopath or psychotic. It was probably somebody who was working in the Central News Agency, who it was addressed to, and it was a way of stimulating interest in the paper and increasing the circulation on the paper. But then it's after that you get a letter sent to Mr. Lusk of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. A letter I believe genuine, a lot of other people believe genuine. The parcel contained a piece of putrefying kidney infected with Bright's disease, the same condition that plagued the fourth victim. Was this man a real life Hannibal Lecter? The letter was addressed from hell and read, Mr. Lusk, sir. Sir, I'll send you I'll half send the you kidney, half kidney I took from, from one woman, one woman preserved, preserved it for you. It's other piece off Friday night. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, if only you wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Now, there's no signature on that one. And it's almost as though our murderer is rejecting the name Jack the Ripper. But with the death of Mary Kelly, the Jack the Ripper murders came to an end. And ever since that time, there's been the great guessing game. Why? What happened? Did he die? Was he locked up? Did he commit suicide? Who was he?
Over a century later, the trail of Jack the Ripper has gone cold. But can we unmask the Whitechapel murderer? The three official suspects were Montague Druitt, Aaron Kosminski, and Michael Ostrog. We know a lot about Montague Druitt. We know his family background. We know that he was a teacher, he was a lawyer. He committed suicide soon after the Mary Kelly killing. His own family believed him to have been Jack the Ripper. Number two on the police list was Kosminski. Now, Kosminski was a Polish Jew, a homicidal maniac who believed he was controlled by forces from outer space. These forces told him that he had to eat the food that he found on the streets. Number three on the police list was Michael Ostrog. He may actually have been locked up in prison in France at the time of the murders. So why he was a suspect, we don't really know. Ever since that time, the list has been added to. It gets longer year by year. The monarchy has traditionally played a central role in London life, with Buckingham Palace at its heart. The daily spectacle of the changing of the guard is watched by hundreds of tourists. In revealing the true identity of the Ripper, one popular theory puts the royals themselves squarely in the dock. Did Jack the Ripper have blue blood? The royal uh, conspiracy centers on the Duke of Clarence, who was a grandson of Queen Victoria, potentially a future King of England. But according to a particular theory, he makes a secret marriage to a commoner, a Roman Catholic. And this secret marriage was allegedly witnessed by Mary Kelly, the fifth of the Ripper's victims, who tells her friends of this secret marriage. And the friends she tells are the four earlier victims. So you have this great plot to protect the throne. It involves the police, the Freemasons, and the royal surgeon, Sir William Gull, sort of driving around these streets and having these poor women killed and mutilated. It's not true. I mean, the poor man had a stroke some time before. Nobody can say absolutely certain um, who it was. It will go on and on and on forever. All I would say is, going from my police experience, if no murder happened after the 8th of November, Mary Jane Kelly, how long would they keep that aid going to Whitechapel? How long would they be flooding the area? Extra policemen began patrolling the East End shortly after the first murder. With such a high-profile case, the force couldn't withdraw them until they were convinced that the murders would cease. But all patrols stopped suddenly on December 10th, only one month after the body of the fifth victim was found. Why? Now that, to me, to a police officer, will say that those in charge of that case were absolutely convinced they knew who Jack the Ripper was. The key officers in this were Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline. He then reported to a Detective Chief Inspector Swanson, Donald Sutherland Swanson. None of the detectives investigating the case ever revealed the Ripper's true identity. But in 1987, new information turned the mystery on its head. Descendants of Detective Inspector Swanson found a police book among his possessions. In the book were his own penciled notes. The family spokesman is great-grandson Neville Swanson. The policeman that was put in charge of Jack the Ripper case was my great-grandfather. He was called Donald Sutherland Swanson. And I've known since uh, childhood, I suppose, that, uh, that he had that job and that his papers existed somewhere in the family. So quoting from the notes, it says, the only person who ever saw the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to give evidence against him. On suspect's return to his brother's house in Whitechapel, he was watched by city police by day and night. Knowing the identity of the killer, the police had him committed to a lunatic asylum. In a very short time, the suspect, with his hands tied behind his back, was sent to Stepney Workhouse and then to Colney Hatch and died shortly afterwards. In the detective's closing notes, he names the man he believed to be Jack the Ripper. Kosminski. 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 Kosminski was the suspect. But if the police were so certain that they had their man, one mystery still remains. Why was he never prosecuted? The police uh, could or would have prosecuted him, but they obviously needed uh, people to testify and Kosminski was a Polish Jew, and the people who would have testified were also Polish Jews, and they didn't wish to testify and have that on their conscience. So they refused to testify. So the police, knowing who Jack the Ripper was, therefore had him uh, put into secure um, detention, and then the murder stopped. 
Now, all I would say, I don't know who Jack the Ripper was, but if the two officers that investigated that crime in 88 said it was Kosminski, that's probably good enough for me. And until somebody can disprove Kosminski, disprove all that, um, to me, that I think is probably the best bet myself uh, for, the, for the name of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was one man with a taste for murder. But through the centuries, London's ruling classes have executed many more than he did. Our investigation into the hidden city of London continues with a traditional English custom. Each year, on November 5th, hundreds of bonfires burn across the city as millions celebrate Guy Fawkes Night. Guy Fawkes was a 17th century terrorist, captured trying to blow up the Houses of Parliament with two tons of gunpowder. Fawkes was imprisoned in one of the most brutal and terrifying places of all, the Tower of London. Yeoman warder Phil Wilson has patrolled the tower for five years. Of course, Guy Fawkes was caught in the act, there with the flame just about ready to light the gunpowder. He was brought to the Tower of London. He would have been asked to name all his co-conspirators. Of course, he refused. A torture warrant was issued. That meant being placed on the wall in manacles, hung, so the weight of your body tortured you. That was called soft torture. Guy Fawkes didn't break under soft torture, so his jailers resorted to more exacting methods of interrogation. Guy Fawkes soon willingly gave the name of all his co-conspirators and probably anybody else he could think of at the time. The signatures on these confessions before and after his torture showed just how broken the prisoner became. Signing them would condemn him to a very public death. Public executions were great affairs, almost like public holidays. Everybody was given the day off to attend executions. Lots of cheering, lots of rushing forward and dipping pieces of rag into the blood of the poor victim, freshly decapitated. Before, of course, the head was taken to London Bridge and the body returned to the tower, again for burial without ceremony in the chapel. Guy Fawkes was a lucky man. At least he is remembered for his crime. In the chapel at the Tower of London, 19th century workmen made a terrifying discovery. Under the flagstones, they unveiled a sinister secret. They found over 1,500 bodies beneath the floor. These, of course, have all been executed on Tower Hill, brought to the chapel for burial, buried in an unmarked grave. No stone to mark the spot, no priest to say a prayer, no friends to grieve at the gravesite. Only 33 bodies were ever identified. One of them was Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII, beheaded here on Tower Green. When Anne Boleyn's head was lifted, her eyes were still surveying the scene and her lips were still in motion of prayer, which made the witnesses rather afraid because, of course, she had been found guilty of witchcraft and they left the scene very quickly. At night, some have reported seeing Anne Boleyn's tormented ghost wandering the tower, her severed head by her side. But she's in good company. The tower is said to be the most haunted building in the world. Some claim to have seen two laughing boys playing on the greens and running in the corridors. Are they the ghosts of the boy princes held at the tower by their evil uncle Richard? Duke of Gloucester. The boys mysteriously vanished, but nearly two centuries later, skeletons were discovered buried under a staircase at the tower. The riddle of their disappearance will never be solved, 
Some believe it was their jealous uncle who ordered the boys to be suffocated in their sleep so that he would take their place on the throne. But there is one corner of the tower where the bloody truth is darkest of all. We're now in the lower chamber of the Wakefield Tower. This is a building that most looks like what people conceive to be a dungeon. It's cold, it's dark, it's dank. The small windows, would they give no chance of escape? The only way out of this chamber was, of course, through the door. It was after the Battle of Wakefield that some 200 prisoners during the War of the Roses were marched to the Tower of London, placed in this chamber, wounded and diseased. They were left to rot and die. The desperate prisoners died in unimaginable pain and suffering, and their corpses were dumped in the River Thames. But the tower is not the only building in London said to harbor the dead. The West End is the Broadway of Europe. This is Theaterland, with over 40 playhouses in a single square mile. The Theatre Royal at Drury Lane is hundreds of years old and seats two and a half thousand theatre-goers, both living and dead. Mark Fox has been at the theatre since 1992. He claims to know of at least three ghosts that haunt the building, and he has a possible explanation for one of them. Now in the 1840s, they created a new entrance for the poorer working class people, which allowed them access to the top levels of the building from the inside. So from these stairs, they knocked through this wall to create an entrance to the upper circle. And in this void area, they found a skeleton with a dagger in its ribs, dressed in 18th century garb. And that all ties in with the story of the man in grey. Now here in the upper circle, there have been many reported sightings of the mysterious man in grey, sometimes by more than one person at the same time. He always visits during the daytime, is friendly, and it's seen as a good omen for a show if he appears during the dress rehearsal or the early stages. He's dressed in 18th century clothes, and he walks all the way along the back of the upper circle and disappears into the wall. Now, in addition to his eerie walk across the back of the upper circle, the man in grey has also been sighted sitting in this very seat. And once, during an on-stage photo call, over half the cast of Glamorous Night reported seeing him sitting here, looking at them. So what is it like to witness a ghost? Nick Bromley's close encounter came while working here as company manager in 1987. As I stood here, I was watching the stage like this. I suddenly was pushed violently out of the way, like that, and knocked out of the way by his hand. I spun round, thinking it was somebody playing a joke but the wing was completely empty. Bromley had had a brush with Dan Leno. Leno was a well-loved performer who, at the height of his fame, beat Charlie Chaplin to become world champion clog dancer. He was later renowned as the king of pantomime dames. Two nights later, the actresses were waiting in the wings, various parts of it, to go on stage for their scene. And one was standing exactly where I was standing. And as she stood there, she felt a hand pull her wig like that. She screamed, but there was no one there. And our theory is that Dan, who was a bit of a ladies' man, would knock a man out of the way if he was blocking his entrance, but just give the lady a little bit of a tweak to move her aside. Lino died tragically at the age of 44. He had been plagued all his life by ill health and used lavender water to mask the smell of his incontinence. Today, at the Theatre Royal, he is not only felt, but smelt. People began to tell stories of smelling the lavender, and it would come in waves. Waves of this strong scent would assail certain parts of the wing. Um, I've smelt it just behind where you're standing, 
and also in the company office, which he used as a quick change room. And this smell comes from nowhere. It suddenly drifts across on the air. But the most notorious of all Drury Lane's ghosts is the boisterous spirit of Joey Grimaldi. His act is used by clowns throughout the world. He was renowned for the energy that he had in his performances. He used to run from here to Sadler's Wells um, in less than 20 minutes in order to give two performances in either building on the same night. He worked so hard and he did so many acrobatic tricks that he actually ended up completely crippled and he died young. Frustrated by the premature end to his career, Grimaldi has stayed at the theatre to lend encouragement to his fellow actors. He's renowned for appearing here on the stage and giving a kick up the bottom to any lazy actors. The theatre stands on a site first used for performance in 1663. The early buildings were hastily erected with little thought for safety. There have been four theatres on this site, and in here is the original, built during the reign of Charles II. Of the four theatres, two of them have burnt down. In 1982, when we were playing here with the Pirates of Penzance, the farman uh, called us up in a great panic, saying he could smell the smell of burning. Well, we searched everywhere backstage, every bit of scenery, every prop room, nothing went home, but twice that night he phoned the fire brigade and had them come and check out again because he was certain the place was on fire. Well, it wasn't, but the only thing we can think of is it was a manifestation of one of those original fires which had destroyed the building. The River Thames snakes through the heart of London. It's as much an icon of the city as the buildings it passes. And each landmark tells its own tale. But at one building on the Thames, there are bizarre happenings its occupants cannot explain. In search of London's darker mysteries, we sail 22 miles up the River Thames to one of the most glorious palaces in England. Hampton Court represents 500 years of royal history, and with it, countless hauntings. The palace's priceless art collections attract 700,000 visitors every year. Guided tours are given by warders like Ian Franklin. The most famous resident of Hampton Court, of course, is Henry VIII. It was his pleasure palace. It's a place where he came to enjoy himself with atmosphere galore. It's just a tremendous place to be. Even in James the First time, William Shakespeare and the King's Men are said to have performed here. So it's a great tradition of entertainment. Patrolling the palace after dark, Franklin has had some unsettling experiences, times when he's felt the company of others. We are trained security officers, and we know when a sound or a feeling or a sensation or a smell belongs, because that's our job. The sound of footsteps going across a carpeted floor uh, makes a certain noise. So does the sound of someone walking across an uncarpeted floor. When you hear that uncarpeted sound in a room with a carpet, as some of my colleagues have done, you obviously take that perhaps with a little bit more than a pinch of salt. There are too many reliable witnesses to just totally disregard it. I don't think you need to give a name to these things to make them valid. The fact is that things do happen. My own personal experience occurred in some rooms quite close to the Great Hall, in fact. The fingertips on my left hand became cold, and gradually that cold crept up through my fingers, through my hand, up to my elbow. And basically, by the time I felt cold up to my elbow, my hair was standing on end, and I didn't feel particularly comfortable. It was suggested to me that something was draining energy from me through my left hand. If someone can give me a scientific explanation, I'd love to hear it. Ghost hunter Robert Snow could be just the man. Franklin has invited him to Hampton Court to investigate. Hello, are you Robert? Yes, I am. You must be in. Nice, nice to meet you, Robert. Yeah, Good to see you. Let's get into the warm, shall we? Well, thanks very much for coming to see us tonight. I hope your journey uh, won't be in vain. I hope we'll show you something which will 
interest you. Yes. Why do you think um, Hampton Court Palace is actually haunted? Is it a little more than hearsay, myths and legends? I think Hampton Court is, is quite unique in that for about 150 years there are stories of things which seem to happen on a relatively regular basis. Uh, there's a whole weight of evidence from people who work here today, people who are sensible enough not to exaggerate or make things up. So there was a lady uh, who was, in fact, on this very staircase. That's a coincidence. That's coincidence very strange, isn't it? isn't it? The lady who had the near-death experience lived in the apartment just up there. Came out and saw this apparition coming up the stairs wearing a pair of leather kid gloves. That was something that stuck in her yeah. mind. And she later discovered that a friend of hers in Germany had died on that very night at about the same time. And she was buried in a pair of leather kid gloves. People say they have paranormal experiences. I don't doubt, I've had paranormal experiences myself. I've seen ghosts, I've had some very noisy ghosts. If you actually think that there are no such things as paranormal activity in the world, it's all an imagination, well, then it's time to think again. Well, this is the Haunted Gallery, Robert. What's supposed to happen here? Well, this is the place where Catherine Howard is supposed to come back and visit the scene of uh, where she was arrested to try and attract Henry VIII's attention. He was in the, or she thought he was in the Holy Day closet just through that doorway there. What sort of experiences do people have? What yeah. are you feeling now? It feels cold, it does feel colder suddenly, just, just now. My and hands and my face. Face, yeah, absolutely. And this, in extreme cases, people actually faint. Yeah, that's, that's rather strange because people don't usually faint because the place is a little on the cool side. Well, absolutely, but it, it certainly happens here. There's got to be another reason. I can't see that it's just mm. um, the fact it's, it is a little colder. Well, that's, that's the mystery of the haunted gallery. I mean, that basically, in a nutshell, is it. 90% of hauntings can be explained through careful investigation, but it's the odd 10% that interests me. And it's just possible that this, um, this gallery, what happens here, people fainting, could possibly fall into that odd 10%. This way. So, what is this room called? Well, this is the Wolsey Closet. So cool because it dates back to Wolsey's time, we think, and it might have been a private chapel. Uh, and it's got an absolutely dreadful reputation. Visitors have come in here and complained of seeing dogs. Really? Amazingly what enough. What sort of dogs? Big hairy ones, apparently. <laughs> um, and that particular area over there, that has got a very bad reputation indeed. This, this is probably a garderobe. Yes or an oratory of some description. I think what we'll do initially is to um, set up some control objects, see what happens. Now a control object is a coin, you can have a key or something, you place it on a piece of card and you draw a line around it. So if the object actually moves, uh, you can tell what direction it's moved and how much. Nobody really knows why, you never see them move, you never hear them move, but you can see the result afterwards. I've put this carefully in the, in the closet. If you can shine it on the yeah, floor. Sure. Leaving another set of controls in the room, Snow sets up his camcorder to keep a watchful electronic eye. Sounds like a good idea. Excellent idea. London said to be the most haunted capital in the world. Uh, Britain is the most haunted country in the world and the story is that the Tower of London is the most haunted building in the world. There again, like Hampton Court is extremely old, it's very difficult to find a very old building which hasn't some myth or legend attached to it. There's uh, the site of Newgate Prison, is said to be haunted. There's St Bartholomew's Church. I believe even Buckingham Palace and the Houses of Parliament have their own ghosts. The list goes on and on. OK then, Robert, well, let's get back and see what we've got. I wonder if anything has moved. It would be lovely if it had. Check the coins for... No? No, I'm afraid not tonight. Oh dear. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Yes, but I mean, it doesn't mean to say there isn't any paranormal activity here, for want of better words. Old buildings at night are not the most welcoming of places. 
But imagine how disturbing it could be in a part of town that has never seen daylight. Westminster, in the heart of London, is Britain's political hub and home to matters of vital national security. But these buildings were not built to withstand the impact of the Blitz of World War II. Instead, Winston Churchill's war cabinet held their meetings at a top secret location below ground. Now a museum, the cabinet war rooms have been left exactly as they were when they were abandoned in 1945. The museum's director is Phil Reed. The war cabinet is basically a very small number of ministers under the prime minister meeting here to control the war. No question of the general public knowing about it. The principal people, of course, who didn't know about it were the Germans themselves. I mean, they would have expected Churchill to be somewhere, certainly several hundred feet further underground than this, and probably somewhere less likely than the centre of town. I don't suppose the British meant it as a double bluff, but I think probably that's the way it worked out, really. Map room duty officer. The real fortifications came in the form of a six to ten feet thick piece of concrete reinforced with steel rails and steel rods uh, that really covered the whole site to one whole floor depth above us. And that theoretically was meant to stop um, up to 250 kilo bombs. It wasn't a popular site to, to sleep or to work in, uh, no daylight. Um, not really a great feeling of safety despite everything. And this is where those poor, poor sods had to work basically around the clock really. Winston Churchill himself was probably the, the least keen occupant of the place. It was largely because he was a man who basically didn't like to keep his head below ground um, and preferred to be you know, in the face of things, in the action, really. I mean, renowned, for instance, for going on the roof during bombing raids and watching the air raids. Today, the cabinet war rooms are visited by 300,000 tourists every year. But during World War II, they were so secret that only a handful of people knew about them. Even so, the authorities realized that security could be compromised at any time. As a precaution, they built reserve bunkers elsewhere. This is somewhere I've been waiting to get into yeah. for literally years. At Dollis Hill in North London, a group calling themselves Subterranea Britannica are preparing for a mission to seek out and explore the secret city under London. Today, they have access to one of Churchill's reserve command bunkers. Exploring this subterranean world has become a passion for Nick Catford. As a senior member of the group, he spends most of his spare time burrowing in the dark. This way, gents. Wow, look at that. Places like this are part of the history of London. I think a lot of people are unaware exactly what's under their feet, what's around them. I like to uh, explore things, you know, if possible for the first time. You know, it doesn't worry me if it gets a bit dirty. Yeah, no, I like them like this. It's uh, rather reminiscent of the, uh, the turrets on the Maginot Line in France. Yes. There are places I've been to where you've got one ear in the water and the other ear on the ceiling, and you've got about three inches of, of breathing space, and that's all part of the fun of it. Uh, one of these should be the, uh, the map room where the, the war cabinet would have met. I find it very atmospheric, the water on the floor, the, the rotting cables. It's, it gives you a, a sense of history to, to be here for the first time. This is the place. This is the cabinet war room. This is where they would have sat. Churchill would have chaired the war cabinet in this very room. You can smell the cigars, can't you? <laughs> you can understand how he hated it, though, can't you? I mean, in his memoirs, he put how it's far from the light of day, a most dismal place. No, was it supposed to be bomb-proof? I think they hoped it would be, um, but you know, nothing is necessarily totally bomb-proof. Its purpose would have been as a standby to the cabinet war rooms under Whitehall. If Whitehall had been blitzed, then the whole war cabinet would have moved to Dollis Hill. Right, see if we can uh, find the bathroom now. It should be this last door on the right here. Here we go. This is it. Yes. That is... Still got the original control panel. Yeah. I smell the needle still. Can you start it, Robin? Give it a crank. 
No, no, no it won't well. <laughs> There are probably tunnels that we haven't been told about. Tunnels maybe that go from Buckingham Palace to, to whisk the Queen away in the event of war. There are certainly tunnels that link all the major government buildings that, that could be used. They're man-sized passages and we just don't get to see those. There's a system of tunnels in London that is known about and used by millions. Every year, the equivalent of the entire population of Australia travel through a 250-mile network of subway tunnels. It's known as the Tube. But these spaces have not always been used for transport. When the population was forced underground to shelter from the Blitz, tube stations doubled as life-saving bomb shelters. The 130,000 people who sleep every night in tube stations raise a good many problems. They get there early and so need something to eat long before bedtime. What these modern commuters don't know is that every day they pass inches from a secret world. Mike Ashworth and Peter Woods are employed to keep an eye on this forgotten part of London. A lot of people have this real fascination with what's actually down underneath London. And of course it's not just the underground, there are miles and miles of other passageways, some of which were used in the war and some of which of course are still in use today. I think one of the strangest things about London, it's effectively hollow. There's actually an awful lot of spaces down below that some people are aware of, but a lot of people are quite fascinated by. This is Down Street Tube Station. Trains pass here without stopping. No longer needed, the station was bricked up in 1932. But with the outbreak of war, Down Street was reopened for use, but not as a station and not to the public. Certain stations were completely altered to become special command bunkers, and some of the line became a factory making aircraft parts. Down Street's platforms were converted to house special communications equipment operated by military personnel. This is what was the platform. This effectively is the back wall. And over here behind this wall that was built is where the trains actually run. In this space, they built the communications centre. Effectively, this is the telephone exchange. Down Street Station, in the early months of the Churchill Premiership, in late 1940, was actually used quite frequently by the Prime Minister and members of the War Cabinet. And there are still places that we can imagine Churchill being in, things like the dining room or the bathrooms. I think it must have been a very peculiar experience to have been down here as a shelterer. You're very divorced in many respects from what's going on up top. It was a very different city that you went back up to in the morning, you know, due to bombing raids. It's not to say that you were completely safe. There were several occasions, unfortunately, where bombs actually did penetrate the tunnels and special measures were taken at certain sites to build protective caps across the tops of shafts. In fact, we're about 60 feet below the ground here. In 1932, the lifts were taken away, and since then it's been used as a ventilation shaft. And here you can see the baffles that were built in to stop the bombs from penetrating from the surface down to the bottom of the station. London's network of hidden tunnels spreads deep and wide. But just how deep and wide is something we'll never know. It's a known fact that uh, Whitehall is, is crisscrossed by tunnels quite vast in their, their size and in their complexity. Um, but it's also a known fact that they're all still top secret. Um, I don't have access to them any more than you do. I think the thing that's fairest to say is it's actually far more crowded down here than it was a hundred years ago. I think there's a lot yet to find. We haven't run out of places yet. So if you're one of the millions who visit London this year, be aware that there is more to this city than you'll ever read about in your guidebook. <laughs>